off top. Researchers have found that cats can make 276 unique facial expressions. 46% of them are friendly. 37% of them are aggressive. Play the music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. Welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show. I'm Dominique Foxworth here with my favorite co-host. Yeah. Charlie Kravitz. Oh, What's oh. up, Charlie? My guy, Charlie Kravitz here. I am... Uh, I've confiscated, commandeered a studio here in New York that is owned by a guy that I like on occasion. Pablo Torre is a guest on today's show. I'm making one facial expression, and it's the face of of of, of stank right now in response mm. to this disrespect. You didn't land it. Like I thought when you said I was making this is you and the classic Pablo Torre jump pass where you start talking without knowing where you're going to land, and I was. I was optimistic. Face of stank is not a thing that anyone else says. I mean, no, I, that's not a thing people say in culture. In culture <laughs> is a thing that people say in culture as well. <laughs> mm. All right, let's get to some good stuff. We have a special surprise guest that may uh He just pop giggled, I think. I point. think I heard I heard a giggle. <laughs> that may pop up at some point. He definitely didn't giggle. Man has a legitimate sense of humor. He's not going to uh, laugh at your foolishness. Anyway, <laughs> but I want to do some deep dive conversation stuff about Football roster construction, Caleb Williams' decision with where he is going to end up next year, and the decision about the teams at the top of the draft. Uh, Charlie, where you want to start, bud? So when, we're, when we talk about continuity in football, we should start with the gold standard. That's the Bill Belichick Patriots, but that is no longer the gold standard. They have been a team that has been average on the field and disarray in roster construction for the last four and a half years. But what's interesting about that and why it's a news pick now, why Colin Coward's talking about it, why there are articles written about it, is because Bill Belichick's coaching tree has been an unmitigated disaster, which was punctuated with a massive exclamation point by Josh McDaniels firing, being replaced by Antonio Pierce. The Raiders played like a loose team. They were smoking victory cigars like they won the Super Bowl in the locker room. And I guess I don't have a particular question, but I wonder if you guys are rethinking what the Patriot way is because yeah. teams have tried to I, bring the Patriot way, this militaristic coaching style, and it has not worked anywhere else. We're talking culture and football is one of my favorite things. It one really of my is. hobby horses when we're, that's where we're going. But I will say that before we get to that, it's important to lay out how embarrassing the Bill Belichick coaching tree has been for the last, I don't know, 20 plus years. Uh, I think Josh McDaniels is the pinnacle of embarrassment because not only did he fail here in less than two seasons with the Raiders, he failed in less than two seasons with the Broncos also, and he decided to draft Tim Tebow. And also in between those, he accepted a job and then backed out of the Colts <laughs> situation, which is embarrassing. And that's not the most embarrassing thing on his resume. No. The most embarrassing thing of his on his resume is that friend of the show, and University of North Carolina alumni Jeff Saturday walked off of the get up set, grabs uh, some head or a headset, threw him on, and out coached Josh McDaniel <laughs> in his first like that. Oh, that's right. That was the first game. That is an indictment that was the first on his game. coaching Got career. Pancaked. Yeah, the only coach in the Bill Belichick tree that's had anything that looks like success is Bill O'Brien. Uh, he had a long tenure at Houston, won a couple playoff games, lost I think four playoff games, and seems like. If nothing else, at least an average NFL head coach, maybe probably slightly above average. The rest of the coaches in the tree are decidedly below average. I will say that there are some hilarious stories well, that's, from I, all of these stops. I was going to say, so as people have tried to import the Patriot way, what they've really imported is a series of like, it's one thing to lose. It's another thing to lose while also telling, in the case of Matt Patricia, Darius Slay, to quote, stop sucking Odell Beckham Jr.'s d yeah. And then walk into <laughs> walk into a meeting and begin by yelling, "All right, everyone, shut the f up!" Yeah. Matt Patricia again. It, it's like an endless list. Of, like Joe Judge was making people run laps. Yeah, it's it just bad. it's the how, Dominique. It's so, the methodology. There's a couple of things that come with this in this conversation to me. Like first of all, I would say I wrote an article about this uh, um, a few years ago about culture and how it's something that I think a lot of coaches, whenever you get a new head coach, he walks in in a press conference, first sense, we're going to change the culture. Everybody says that. 
and no one knows what it means. And I think it's important to understand that you cannot institute a culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what a lot of these Belichick disciples believe that they can do is that they can go in and institute a culture. A culture exists because of the people in the organization, the things that were permitted, the things that were accepted, the things that were encouraged. Those things are how you develop a culture, the behaviors and the processes that an organization accepts, which are influenced by the personalities and the people in the organization. So you cannot show up and just change the culture like you are pulling out a, a disc from a, a computer and putting a new one. I'm old. What an old Yeah, reference. but that is not, like, you don't, change a, you don't change a culture like you change an operating system. It's more gradual than that. And I think you have to understand that culture is to be cultivated and using the the personalities that are there and the culture that already exists, and I like to analogize it to like a, a color spectrum, is you can move a culture and you can move it in a direction to get to a place where you want it to be eventually. But the idea that you can walk in on day one and say, we're doing it this way. It's very hard to do, particularly when you don't have the credibility to do so. So, so the time, I'm sorry, this is, this is the Dominique Fox. It's Fox unfortunately Fox. not Pablo. So, Fox, <laughs> the times and, where okay, we can I move think the ball. Of, You're up next, Pablo. <laughs> yeah. The times where I think about something like that actually working is Tom Brady to Tampa Bay. And the reason why I think that, that was it, a culture hmm, thing. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know that I think it's a culture thing. Yeah, I, I see Charlie getting all hmm. excited about Tom Brady. But the reason why I think... I could argue, so I was not there before and I was not there after. But if you read about it, read about the, his time there, you can tell that the behaviors of the team changed some when Tom Brady was there. The reason why I think that works is because that team was thirsty and Tom Brady came in with six Super Bowl rings. So when Joe Judge shows up and says, you're going to run laps when you make mistakes, what you have to then follow that with is results. I think that the guys, the story that you will write, and it's like any of us in the history of our lives, we will all tell, we can tell different stories. I can tell a story that is about all the times when I did the right thing, how I got to success. Or I can tell a story about all the times where I was lucky and I got to where I, I've gotten. So if Joe Judge has success at the end of the season, people will say, hey, you know why he has success? He had them running them laps. That ain't true. But that's but Dominique, but that's why this story to me is so funny. It's because it's not the perfect culture hobby horse for you. Because it the, is. no, no, no. I believe it's perfect if in fact they're winning. That way you can be the contrarian who's like, look, you're confusing uh might makes right with anything resembling culture. Like it's just such an, to me, this level of obviousness here, Alabaster, where it's like not whoa, only. Whoa, 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 oh, whoa, 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 whoa. He's graduated from Alabaster. Oh, the culture's changed since yeah, I was Yeah, we changed. We do not have a culture where show. we where we degrade people by the color of their hands. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't see color. I don't know what, what are you referring to. Um, I think it would be, um, it would be more fun if like Eric Mangini, who forced rookies to take a 10-hour bus ride from Cleveland to Hartford favorite one. That's to work favorite? at his summer football camp, was good at coaching football so that that way Dominique could come in with the, like the contrarian actually, here's why might does not make right. Here we have might making wrong and people just stepping on rakes repeatedly being like almost a performed caricature of what you think a football coach is because you watched a movie about uh, a football coach. It's once. not because they watched a movie about a football coach. It's because they existed in a situation where the football coach was kind of like this. But mm. we don't hear those stories about Bill Belichick that include like disrespect like this. But we do hear. And I think this goes back to the situation. Bill Belichick was fortunate for his situation. Not to say that he does not deserve the success he had. He's certainly a part of it. But I do think that the culture that he developed was in part because the team that he had, the first Super Bowl that he won, was the team that ran out of the tunnel together. It's the first team in a long time, I guess, in Super Bowl history decided not to be individually introduced. That is like a small thing, but it was indicative of the culture, and it's because they were significant underdogs to the greatest show on turf, Rams. That was the beginning of it. They had a quarterback who was a sixth-round pick, 
who then you can treat him like any old kind of guy. Whereas most of the time you get a first round pick quarterback who you're going to have success with. And then there's a different standard for them. And he also had a quarterback who was comfortable with being continued or being continually treated that way. And I do think that that establishes a culture. When he had good players on defense, he shipped them out before they got too good or too expensive, yep. which then those guys may like demand a different level of respect and different level of treatment, but Tom Brady did not. And so while I think Bill Belichick's culture, Patriot way, whatever you want to call it, worked in New England, I think it's also because the culture fit the personalities and the people there. The idea that any of these other <laughs> can go somewhere else, and since you guys are talking about your favorite uh, um, disciple – uh, rake steps. I like this one where uh, I think Tyler Columbus, it's an old tweet from him talking about Josh McDaniels. Every single day began with a 10 minute bad football reel from the day before where he would dog cuss you and your coach for any bad play from practice 24 hours ago. Set the tone for a real positive day in front of the entire team. Another one. <laughs> We had about 25 slogans painted on the walls. Oh, I love God forbid God forbid you forget what the slogan was above the door entering the cafeteria. Josh would call players out in team meetings and ask what each slogan said. <laughs> if you forgot a single word, <laughs> chewing. So, I feel like one of the slogans might have been <laughs> chewing. <laughs> First of all, thank you producers very much for all this great research that we are re relying on. Absolutely. But I do believe that we've heard stories of how Bill Belichick would do similar things like this after a day of practice, and he would always start it with chewing Tom Brady's <laughs> And that is a different culture, which if you, if you can't do that, and he already had uh, three Super Bowl rings Giants. or a few Super Bowl rings under his belt, or he had two Super Bowl rings with the Giants, but then he had three Super Bowl rings with the Patriots when you start to bring in new faces and different guys, and people recognize it was like a known thing around the league. You're not going to be happy here, but you're going to win. That's a whole different ball of wax if you're going somewhere else where guys are accustomed to being happy. And you're like, hey, f your happiness. And then you don't win. Well, that, so let me And I, then I, you don't can I, win. Can I ask? I, I want to ask both of you guys, um, and maybe our mystery guest as well, um, <laughs> the idea of the Patriot way, though, right? So the big thing at the center of this in the dissection, the postmortem we've just done, is Tom Brady. Yes. And Tom Brady being willing to have his <laughs> chewed out and uh, implied in all of this, too, was taking pay cuts, by the way. Um, the guy who was the greatest quarterback of all time being OK with eating the boot of the greatest coach of all time. And so my question is simply, is the Patriot way? Has it always been? <laughs> um, No. I mean, so Bill Belichick will dismiss you if you use the term Patriot way. It's not a, a term that he coined, but I think it's it's appropriate to describe whatever is unique about their culture. I do not believe it is. I think it's to think that it is the only way to succeed. I think it requires any culture re requires a great deal of effort to maintain. I think this one is one that. The effort to maintain that culture, a lot of it came from the quarterback being willing mm -hmm. to take pay cuts and being willing to be treated like <laughs> And then it starts to sustain itself. I think the idea of anyone else, uh, I think that there are other ways to have success. Like, Not I think, we've seen it proven. Lots of other teams have had success, uh, extended success like over. Well, not yeah, like not that. that. Yeah, not it that many Super Bowls. the paradigm Bowls, in the NFL. Not that many Super Bowls. It was and the I best do team think, for 20 years. I, I'm not arguing. You keep putting up arguments like I'm pushing back. I agree. That's unique. I, but I don't think that that's because this is the best possible culture to have. I think that there are a lot of random things that come together that include the fact that's what is not random, that Bill Belichick is an excellent football coach. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Tom Brady was an excellent quarterback. But those are not in dispute. Yeah, yeah those are not in dispute. Is, is the and culture. Deflate Gate was a real thing. <laughs> Thank you, Wyatt. And the <laughs> tuck rule was a real thing. Uh, I, and they why, won most of those Super Bowls by field goals. <laughs> But That's... anyway, the greatest team of all time, <laughs> including the future. That's right. That In the future, fair. the ideal gas law will finally be disproven, and all of this will <laughs> be will be rendered just to Bill Belichick. Wyatt was a classmate of Jeff Saturday, so he is a uh, hopelessly biased uh, Jeff Saturday oh, supporter. Oh yeah, some, 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 somehow yeah. Dominique found the only person on the planet who's more biased in favor of Jeff Saturday than him. <laughs> I do love Jeff. Um, uh, his son got his first buck this weekend. Congratulations! Wow, they, they be hunting. 
Wow, like a multi-point. One of the what do they call them? Po- like points I, or like I, the I, horns? I, I, I don't know. I grew up points. in an urban center. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> the point I was going to make is that I do think that a lot of the that there are other ways to have success. And like I, I think about, I played the Ravens. It's a distinct culture there, but that culture is very fun and it's like irreverent in many ways and but still aggressive and it's a commitment to each other like I've been on other teams where it feels like you work for the team of course we all work for the team but there was something about that particular culture where it felt like we work for each other and there was an obligation and so anytime I think everybody can feel like some relate to like wanting your boss to see you working it's like you want to be it's something that we did in football too where it's like oh coach is walking around i'm gonna go make sure he sees me watching film let me minimize the window on this computer and pull up a fake spreadsheet exactly that was not or let me make sure my car is the last one to leave that was not something that we did with the ravens because it was real like i wanted to be able to come into practice the next day and say hey ed know what i saw in film last night like, I wanted to do that. I didn't go to, to Chuck Pagano, the defensive back coach, and say, hey, coach. Whereas when I was in Denver, I was certainly like, hey, coach, I was watching film last night. Guess what I saw? Like, no. There was something about that commitment to each other. I've told this story before, like the him thing. Yeah. And it's about how Tom Brady brought himself down to a level with everyone else. You hear about LeBron doing, uh, being very active and trying to make sure that he does not feel like he's separate and apart from the team. It, with the Ravens, the the him thing that we used to do. When I, whenever anyone new was signed with the team, they would stand up in front of the room. You introduce yourself, and they would say, "Him, f- him." And the point was, if you are a big time free agent, or you are a new coach, assistant coach, if you are a new equipment person, no matter what, f- you. It's not about you. It's about us. And no one is. No one is above. Yeah, the and team. that's the, it's the same sentiment that you that you have with the Patriots, but it's delivered in a different way where it's like fun and funny. And I think it matters. And then the commitment that we all saw demonstrated from the, the players who are the leaders of that team is something that permeated the team. So you can have success. You can look at McVay. They've had a lot of success out there. And the conversation about him is it's much more progressive and inclusive. You treat players like they are your peers, not like they are subordinate soldiers. There are different ways to have extended success. I don't think that the Patriot way is proof that the Patriot way is the best culture in football. I think it's proof that it's an effective culture combined with a lot of other elements. Like you could argue the same thing for the 49ers dynasty is one of the best in football. The There's so many times. Would you look at the Cowboys and say that's their dynasty in the 90s? Would you look at them and say, hey, that is all about discipline, accountability, yeah, yeah. and no and no star is bigger than um, the next. But no, no. But Do- Dominique, Dominique, there's something I agree with like 90 percent of what you're saying, except for the way Good. that you're framing it, that that this is proof that the Patriot way worked, because what you're basically saying is that Tom Brady was the sheriff of this team that the fact that he was able to make himself one of the guys is why it worked and that to me begs the question of if this is a of something that works why hasn't it worked ever anywhere else why do you have these coaches that aren't bringing stars down to the level of the team but ostracizing the stars like you have Josh McDaniels in his first stop ostracizing uh Jay Cutler and Brandon Marshall you have yeah, Brian I, Flores I can... ostracizing uh, to a Tonga Vailoa. You have Bill O'Brien comparing DeAndre Hopkins right. to Aaron Hernandez. Like, if this is the culture of just insulting players, that's not um, functional unless you happen to stumble into the greatest player of all time in the sixth round. And see, that's where I, I agree with you. I don't think the culture is degrading your best player. And I think the point that I'm trying to make, and I'm obviously not doing it well enough, is that what happened is that this culture in New England was created as a result of their circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I think Bill Belichick possibly would like to have a militaristic, top-down, aggressive, no one's more important to the team culture. And it also coincided with this team being an underdog team going up against the the greatest show on turf uh, Rams and having that kind of nobody is better than us altogether mentality. And then you tag onto that the fact that the starting quarterback of that team was – obviously a game manager in a six round pick who then perpetuates that. And then you get the ball rolling. And then by the time you get to the point 
where you have to add new people into this who may not be assimilated into this culture. You are shipping out anyone who's who who may feel you're like they are early. bigger than yeah. the team. You're shipping them out before it gets to that point, and you're bringing in people into a culture that's already established of people like this is how we act here. So I'm not saying that that culture is the best culture or that that culture is the worst culture. I'm saying that the reason why it worked was not because of the culture itself, but because of the circumstances and the people in it that allowed it to exist. I think we can all agree to put a button on this that the Patriots culture is not the Raiders costume um <laughs> let's I, I feel like we did all that just so you could make that joke at some point like I thought of it during it me. oh you did oh, good for you. I'm, I'm proud. so proud of myself um I like it. so let's move on because this I, is, hold on hold on before we move on I would like to I mean we got to use our guest host can you put a better button on it well I don't know if I have a better button okay but I had a question oh mm. yeah I my question is how much of the reason that the Patriot way works is because that's who Bill Belichick is and he believes it where like, he's a guy who very much, you know, wants to be an army man and then believes that versus all these other people who are just kind of playing dress up and not being themselves. And they're trying to be versions of him. And because it's not because they don't actually believe it, they right. can't really execute it. So they're just doing the like. Yeah, they're, they're doing they're, the. I learned it from you, Dad. <laughs> well, but it's it's a little. I bit, learned it from you. They're doing it's the Pablo bit, what, what Pablo does to Dan. Wow. <laughs> See, I was gonna wow, say it's a little. That is a. I need to think about that. I was gonna say it's a little <laughs> bit of the thing of like if you you know if you're michael jordan's kids yeah. and you just assume yeah. well i'm great at basketball because i'm michael jordan's kid yeah. and you don't actually you may not put in the amount of work or have or don't believe wait you're saying that steve belichick is going to get engaged to tom brady weiss to giselle bunchen Ooh. Ooh. that There's- tongue the Belichick tongue. It's despicable. That's I mean, a, now that that visual is a bug. I'm now, I'm now shipping this in my, <laughs> Charlie, in my weird fan. Fiction. Charlie, save us, please. Wait, wait. Before before I save you, that was actually that's a great question. How much of this is Thank just that it's imposter syndrome from these guys? Um, I don't know. I don't know them. I think either way, it doesn't matter. I think the the had they had success it would have been different. But I do think that the fundamental misunderstanding that a lot of coaches have or people, anyone who's entering a new organization is that you can institute something brand new. You need buy-in. I I went and talked to the NFL PA earlier this week, the staff there, um, about being a player and about leadership going forward. And the point that the, the biggest point, two things that I wanted them to walk away with one of them, that I wanted the staff to completely understand is you don't know. It doesn't matter what you know. What matters is that the players believe in the direction. And I think the same thing is true for players on a team, players in a union, employees at a company, that the most important thing is institutional buy-in. If people will buy into your plan, they will subject themselves to all types of verbal abuse. If that's the style that you want to go about, they will com- they will sacrifice much of their time and effort and body to accomplish anything if they buy into the plan. But the idea that you can just show up and just because you stood next to Bill Belichick, that that's going to get the people to buy in. No, you better pr- produce something or except that you are going to develop this culture together because if they are part of developing it, they will buy into it. Did you ever have any coaches that came from some storied tree and came into the team and tried to like draft off of that? And were you all just kind of like, we're not buying this? <laughs> I didn't. So I, w- I played for uh, Mike Shanahan towards the end of his career. He had already established himself and won two Super Bowls and, and the – father of most of the NFL's modern yeah. offenses today. So he had his uh, cachet. I went down to Atlanta for a season with Mike Smith, who came from Jacksonville. That wasn't nothing that he wanted to <laughs> he wanted to flaunt in front of our faces. And then I was in Baltimore again, and that was a place where um, J- John Harbaugh, he fit into the culture that already existed. And he was there for a year before I got there. But it was very clear that he was 
fighting to twist and turn this in a way that was comfortable for him, how he could fit into an organization that has frankly never been bad, which is, I, I could yeah. argue, while they don't have the Super Bowls to compete with the Patriots, over the course of the time, like what they've accomplished without until now, uh, Hall cheating? of Fame level. Is that what you were going to say? Without, without cheating? Without hiring <laughs> yeah, and without assisting cheating. with yeah, a without big cheating. naval background yeah. to spy on others. And a without a Hall of Fame this, quarterback is the point I was going to make oh. until maybe Lamar now. They've managed to be to win a Super Bowl and be uh, win two Super Bowls and be incredibly competitive year in and year out. Mm. Charlie, are you done now? Can we move on or not? Definitely. Well, that's a, that's okay. a great segue because we're oh, going to talk. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, that's uh let's talk about sustained uh success in the nfl how you get there and the unique opportunity that's laying in front of teams right now and i want to lay the parameters now for the type of sustained success we're talking about we're talking about the chiefs we're talking about the patriots dynasty the packers the steelers the ravens being the outlier that dominique said because they were able to build it without the quarterback first the 49ers dynasty the cowboys and i bring those up because it's time to talk about this NFL draft and the unique yeah. prospects at the top. You have Caleb Williams and Drake May, who I don't know who you want to put at number one or number two. It's guys who are really, really highly sought after. Caleb Williams says some people have thought he's been the best quarterback prospect in years. Drake May is now above him on a lot of boards and people are viewing him as a supercharged Justin Herbert. There's Marvin Harrison Jr. There's Caleb Williams high school teammate who's the top left tackle in the draft and is thought to be one of the best pass protectors in years. And I bring that up because of the Bears. The Bears have a chance to have maybe the one in, number one and number two pick, maybe the number one and number three pick. And earlier this season, people were saying if the Bears get the number one pick, Caleb Williams should demand out. But I ask you this because, I bring this up because they have a chance for a supercharged rebuild. If I were to tell you that one of these quarterback prospects could be paired with DJ Moore and Marvin Harrison Jr., someone who's 6'4 and had a top speed higher than Tyreek Hill last year, You'd be like, that's a great situation. And so, Pablo, person who loves accruing draft capital. Love, Dominique, love an asset. Person who hates losing cultures. Do you view this as something that can be a turbo turnaround because this is such a unique opportunity? I love that this show, which pioneered the take of Justin Fields, needs to demand out of the Bears because their culture, because their organization is so d is now contemplating actively, do we now need to get Drake Mayer, Caleb Williams in here and ship Justin Fields out? Because actually More he is capital. not, or draft capital, because he is not enough. And I, you know, it's funny, right? The Caleb Williams story in a nutshell is the cautionary tale, right? Here we have another player for whom we had the highest expectations. He was hailed as of, I don't know, last month as the closest thing to Patrick Mahomes since Patrick Mahomes. And now he's struggled. We've seen him cry into his mom's arms as she shields his helmet with like a, a piece of paper. And he's now being scrutinized on the level of, oh, maybe this kid is a choker. And so the idea that you would take Justin Fields, who has given you some optimism, but within this contaminated experiment, and you're now going to punt on him to get one of these other guys who's shown you in a month that he is not necessarily what you think. I, the balls that is... that are, Dominique, if you're a GM, mm -hmm. okay? Dominique Foxworth, general manager of the Bears. What kind of elephantitis balls do you need to say, actually... Give me another shot at this. Well, I they, want, I want, the, I want another. Ryan, kid. Ryan Poles wasn't there for drafting Justin Fields, so I don't think it requires. Would, would it? It would require elephant size uh, fortitude in order to pass on those quarterbacks. Mm. I think the how you get fired is by passing on a quarterback like that. I'm not sure the right thing to do is to draft one of those quarterbacks, but I do know that if you don't draft one of those quarterbacks, you better win and win fast, and you better hope that they stink wherever they go. Well, that's the thing, right? So the, the Ryan Poles example is is the vital question, and the, and the reality of drafting a quarterback is that at least you're buying time. You're buying time, and you're – affixing yourself to this person's yes. success. I the idea well when you have a pick that high, it's very unlikely that it's a decision that you're going to make all by yourself. The owner of the organization, the coach, general manager, everyone's going to have some say in that decision. I will say this that fundamentally in in a in this specific situation, it's hard for me to look at all of these quarterbacks including uh, Jaden Daniels and Trevor Penix, like the other really Michael good Penix. quarterback. 
Well, my, who, who am I thinking? Trevor somebody. Michael Penix. Trevor Simeon. Trevor Simeon was who I was thinking about, the great NFL quarterback <laughs> who should take over the Jets because what's going on with I'm uh, going to be honest. I never pronounce Michael Penix's name correct in my head. Yeah, because you're, you're you. But the point that I was going to make is fundamentally I believe that the most important thing is to build up a talented roster before you get the quarterback. So you're taking the tackle. I am a because I'm taking the quarterback, so the, Dominique. The, I'm taking the easy way out. I'm buying some extra lives, some extra lives the, in this video game. The the funny thing about this is, I think I'm probably buying more capital, which is your favorite thing to do, mm. because I recognize that I can be wrong, and the more chances I get. And the better the overall roster is, the better chances I have of finding the quarterback. Because it is my belief that quarterbacks are developed, and part of them being developed is you surrounding them with enough skill and talent to buy them time exactly, to though. add things to their game. Exactly, What's and that's what's unique about this, is this is a team yeah, that already a has more than, more than enough draft capital because of the Bryce Young trade, which, right. if this goes a certain direction could be looked at as a trade that launches a really successful organization. Not quite to the Herschel Walker trade, but something like that, a trade launching an offensive juggernaut. And you look at Joe Burrow, they paired him with Jamar Chase instead of Panay Sewell, and no one's regretting that pick now because you have Burrow throwing to Chase and Higgins. And the idea of, whether it's Caleb Williams or Drake May, throwing to DJ Moore and Marvin Harrison Jr. or Brock Bowers or whoever... While having a full uh, stock draft cabinet, while trading Justin Fields, we got to remember they traded Lego head Sam Darnold for a second round pick. <laughs> they traded Trey Lance, who can't play in the NFL, for a fourth round pick. Well, Justin right. Fields has been a fringe starter in the NFL. He's shown enough. That guy's getting a second round pick, a really valuable pick for this team. So you're yep. going to have five elite prospects in the next two years walk in your door to surround whatever quarterback you pick. So you definitely draft a quarterback. I think that's. I think you draft one of these quarterbacks because they do have the pedigree that you don't pass on. I think I was saying overarching generally, my general philosophy is you don't know. So you pass on the quarterback and you find out that a lot of great quarterbacks in this league were drafted in the middle of the first round or later. So the idea that you have to be at the top to get a quarterback, I think is a bad way to go about yes, building a team. also true. However, there are occasions where there are guys that we know. Trevor Lawrence, Andrew Luck, guys like that. You're like, all right, we know this guy's going to be good. We draft him. Or, or um, yeah, Joe Burrow. Guys Peyton that Manning. you kind of, yeah, Peyton Manning, you know you draft him. These guys are trending in that direction. So I think you draft one of them. You have another pick. And I think the only real question is, do you believe that you go tackle or receiver? Right. Right? With their O-line, do you go tackle or receiver? And I <sighs> – I feel like you go receiver. I, I that mean, might look, just me being a modern. And there, there's a point to this too, where Caleb Williams is a particularly interesting case. Let's, for the sake of discussion, let's imagine it's Caleb Williams who has been this incredibly high ceiling prospect. But this season, he's regressed not just for the the, yeah. the, the choker thing. It's the fact that he's played worse under pressure than he's he had in his prior year, prior two years. He's holding the ball too long. He's playing out of structure. Um, but those and, are, by the way, two things that we also praised him for. The yeah. idea that he Ooh. would just create stuff out of structure by holding the ball longer than anybody normally might. So I think the Mahomes thing is interesting. It's that, The Mahomes thing is that, like, where that comp started is that he was right. elite in structure. And then when things broke down, he could be Superman. And that's the Patrick Mahomes thing. And that's what we thought Caleb Williams was robo QB with the physical capabilities to everything that broke that, when it broke down. If he's going to be something closer to a play style of a Kyler Murray or a Russell Wilson, that's... Still an excellent, an excellent, excellent prospect, but somewhat different. And then we should mention just how ridiculous Marvin Harrison is. We're talking yeah. about someone who's a receiver prospect like Calvin Johnson, like Charles Rogers. Like and, and the 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 impact of receivers on offenses in modern NFL also is part of the reason why mm -hmm. I would lean away from the tackle, no matter how great the tackle is, yep. is because we've noticed that again. With all the really good quarterbacks in football, the young ones uh, have gotten better. We paired them with great receivers. And this is another one of your theories of, yeah, of I mean, football it's, now. It, it feels, yeah, it feels like when you have a guy like that and a coach that knows how to use him, you can get uh, this version of Josh Allen, which is not 
the last version of Josh Allen. Yeah, you can get, get your this, Tyreek Hill, get you, your stuff on Diggs. You can get, your get this version Demar of Tua. Chase. You can get this version of Jalen Hurts. All because you got Tyreek and you got A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith. So if you can walk into a league with a guy who has the ability to show up and be great like Justin Jefferson and Marvin Harrison Jr., and you have a quarterback that has – some level of ability, uh, high or high level of ability. Like I feel like the Bears could potentially ruin this, but I can't imagine a better like situation for a crap place like well, the Chicago Bears have been a crap organization like forever. Frankly, well, that's still looking for a quarterback. Still looking for a quarterback in a way that is is mind boggling. It also feels though to return to the job security aspect of people making these decisions, like. If you put this to a vote, <laughs> the fan base is taking a quarterback and they're taking Marvin Harrison Jr. Of course. Like, mm-hmm. it's it's one of those things where, like, the smart theory of football, because of the trending of the game, which you've covered on this show, as well as anybody, it has now justified the most, like, n- lack of impulse control, Madden-friendly um, theories that I have right. when I'm building a team in a video game. I picked, when we had the the Sewell or Chase debate, I was like, give me Sewell because I'm a smart football guy and right. I'm going to stay away from the sexy. I'm going to go with what I know is important, protection. Joe Burrow went on to get sacked a trillion times <laughs> and hurt a bunch more times, but you know what? They was in the damn Super Bowl and they're in the conference championship when they're not in the Super Bowl when Joe Burrow is standing up right what you got charlie so a crazy thing about this the the tackle we keep talking about olu fashanu from penn state caleb williams high school left tackle someone that mel kuyper said in any other draft that doesn't have caleb williams and marvin harrison would be the top pick on the board he said he would have been the first pick in last year's draft so there is some cachet of right i mean that's wanna- what Penn. that's what penny soul was too like we talked but about penny soul like he, he wasn't joe of- he wasn't joe burrow's high school teammate <laughs> well, this is we are. Oh, we, oh, this is this is this the is an appeal of to, to to reunite <laughs> yes. the left tackle and his quarterback, just like so, Burrow and Chase. Again, shout out to the producers for doing some great research for this. I think we have 17 times where teams mm-hmm. had two first round picks or two top 10 picks in the first round in the NFL draft. And while we're all salivating about how great an opportunity this is for the the. Bears, and I would also point out that I hate the draft as a process. Let's not reward okay. reward people for sucking, okay. yeah, but and yeah. also force people draft to go rocks. work somewhere they don't want to. They don't want to go to work. It's such but a anyway, TV product. We have not seen it work. Like we haven't seen people build dynasties off of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm looking at this list of. It's players. pretty remarkable how yeah. often the things that we're all very confidently declaring generational end up being. Yeah. Um, what yeah, on on this doesn't. on this list? Which I mean, Lavar Arrington, Chris Samuel. At Washington, that's a pair of really good players. But John, it didn't Springs, really... John Springs, Walter Jones, probably the best oh, on the list. Yeah, but um, we we're not looking at perennial playoff dominant teams with these these uh these pairings. I guess some of these teams went on to have success, but it wasn't because both of these guys were hits. There's also uh, not a single person on this list where it's force multiplier, where it's quarterback, wide receiver, quarterback, left tackle, which is what's interesting about the the top of this draft. It's positions that work together and. Yeah. There's one that's not on this list because it's they traded up to the spot, which was last year, which is CJ Stroud and Will Anderson. And it's different because they gave up draft capital to get that, and it makes it much more of a one-to-one swap compared to these, where it's just additional draft capital in the top 10 twice this year. But that one we have already seen worked, where it's like if you do get two top-like guys at impact positions, edge and quarterback, it can change your team really fast. Can I ask a question here? And it might be a simple question, uh, but maybe there's like, two people who are listening to this who are like thank you for asking that question uh and being the idiot in the room but you were talking about that that choice of whether you take marvin harrison jr or you take a left tackle and if you're the bears and your whole offensive line isn't great how much can one left tackle compensate sure. or shift something like can they can they make that much of a difference if the rest of the o-line is garbage yes really yes um because i think the the term force multiplier is a good one because what you then can do if he is as good as i don't know jonathan ogden it's like you know what and all of his alone. 
Yeah. Also, uh, that's where Charlie went to school. Yeah, okay. He yeah, was okay. also off. Charlie, who you're looking at right now, played the <laughs> imagine, same position. Imagine the opposite of an urban center, and you have St. Albans. <laughs> yeah, and and Charlie, Charlie played offensive line at the same school that Jonathan Ogden played offensive line. Just so you guys know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so if you have someone with the amount of dominant edge rushers that there are in the NFL right now. If you have someone that you can leave isolated on him, on a edge rusher, that does allow for flexibility with the other four guys. If you have someone that you know that they're going to move their best pass rusher away from, that gives you some flexibility with the other guys. If this person is that good. If you add a good offensive lineman, eh, it's not going to do much. If you add someone that's great, that is not going to give up sacks against Miles Garrett, let's say. Like, not give up any pressures against Miles Garrett. We do not have to uh, reconfigure our offensive line. We saw that, was it the Titans that played the, the Browns earlier in the season? And they had two tight ends following Miles Garrett everywhere he goes just to make sure that he did not destroy their play. You have a guy that you're like, Miles, so what? Yes. Because then you have four other guys to block three, or and you can also anticipate where the blitzes are coming from. Because oh, I can not hear Dominique him. talking himself back into alignment. Yeah, you, you feel it. You feel it. You feel it. <laughs> Dominique is getting off, and how smart this take is. I also, mean, it's Charlie, good. feel free to say that was a great question. Great, it was a great question, and I have a follow up to your great, your great question, which I would yeah, ask Dominique do. also: is how much can a quarterback elevate an offensive line, getting rid of the yeah. ball and understanding what to do under pressure? Um, I think. A great deal. So when you have an athletic quarterback, the uh, the defensive lineman will rush uh, a little less aggressively. That makes it easier. When you have a quarter- quarterback that makes quick decisions, it discourages the defensive line from rushing because they are tired of coming off the ball all hard and then the ball getting being gone. So it changes the way that you play. And if he can get rid of the ball quickly, we saw it uh, on Monday night with uh, Zach Wilson. You got to get rid of it. You got to get rid of the ball. Like, they are not going to block them up every time. Zach Wilson, it. number two overall pick. I oh, yeah, we saw it, which is why I always opt for it. Give me more picks, please. Uh, we saw it with Dak Prescott at the end of the game against the Eagles. It's like, that Eagles defensive line, they're going to get to you. You need to throw that away so you have more opportunities at the end of the game. So, yes, uh, a quarterback who makes good decisions, a quarterback who's athletic, who can shake off these guys, who's strong, like, that changes the dynamic for the offensive line. You know what? The tough thing about this, though, is like I can also make these really profound, beautiful, aggressive arguments for a receiver mm-hmm. that is that good also. It's like, you know what? You can do a lot easier when you have a receiver that can run Tyree Kill speed at, at 6'4". You know what you can do? You can run the ball because they are not committing any other safeties to the box because go ahead, get your five yards a pop. What we're not going to let you do is go 70 with this dude. Also then, again, thinking about the draft, in a – post Tom Brady world where as you said he was a six round draft pick and he was coached up into right. a a good player you know some people might say great whatever <laughs> of the moment not of all time because yes. we don't know the future <laughs> but <laughs> my favorite take but uh, all time should encompass the we future. have yeah he becomes a you know a slightly above mediocre player <laughs> that history will remember better than they should uh, but no, you have a world like that. You have a world where, you know, San Francisco has built all of these, uh, a team with all of these skill position players and are slotting in and, you know, right. Brock Purdy, that why, why when you have those two things as what seem like the big narratives, the big stories that people like to talk about, whether it's the Patriots and all of their success or San Francisco being able to work with Brock Purdy, are we overvaluing the number one draft pick as a quarterback in this day and age when there is proof of the, you know, oh, you could build a dynasty with a six round draft pick. That's the curse, right? That's the curse of the whole of the draft as a premise. It's you know what you want. The, it's just really hard to know when the thing in front of you is also the thing that you want. It's a lottery, man. And that's the thing. So, like, the reason why, 
I, if I can answer your question, the reason why we look to that spot is because we have seen what it can do. So we saw what happened with the Colts when they got Peyton Manning. We saw what happened with the Colts when they got Andrew Luck. They mismanagement around him. They don't protect him. But you know what? They're in the playoffs every year. They're making coming back from down three touchdowns in the second half of games. We saw. We also saw what happens when you get a great coach like uh, – like uh, Andy Reid in Philly, perennial competitors. You move them out to Kansas City, perennial competitors. We saw what happens when you then add that special piece. Now they are always uh, a championship contender. You saw the same thing in Baltimore where it's like, all right, we're always around. We're pretty good. Give us a special piece, and then we are exceptional. The same thing with anywhere else. And I think that's the reason why people continue to chase this is because a great quarterback makes everything better. The problem is, if as a strategy, your point, your your purpose is we're going to find the great quarterback that makes everything better. To me, fundamentally, that's no different than your retirement strategy being I'm going to play the lottery every day of my right. life. Right. And right. so maybe you got a friend who hit the lottery and they are fine and their retirement is is wonderful and bounteous because they hit the lottery. But you know what? Every other person who followed that strategy is going to fail you're much more likely to do what the Ravens and the 49ers have done is in I guess the Seahawks and other teams who have built up something that's sustainable and then bring a quarterback in keep bringing in quarterbacks so you find the one that's special or you build up around a quarterback that's not special and turn him into good or and hear me out here you just hire an old man to be your coach who just yells at you like he's your disapproving dad is that a is that a the, lottery winning strategy the patriot way <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that works oh what you got for us Chuck that's all I got we're done yeah, the opposite, by the way, of a disapproving fun. dad who's older than you is Charlie Kravitz, as we now must legally call him. Oh, yeah. You got to respect that, man. I love Charlie. Charlie, I miss you up here in New York. We got to get back up here and gallivant. Got to get a gallivant. Ooh, the gallivant to crew. Van. The four of us gallivanted yeah. not so long ago. Yeah, and that was a fun gallivant. It was. You, it was we did band. all gallivant together. Yep. Well. Right. We're, we're, saw calling it, we're calling it. Wait, we're calling it a vant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not getting that. drunk, just uh, no, vanting. Not, not getting drunk in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> it's called gallivanting. Wow, like the mom. Carrie. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> the Carrie, Charlie's fiance. All right, thank you guys, my multiple co-hosts today, Charlie, Wyatt, Pablo. Thank Who you. Who is your favorite? Um, I mean, obviously it's you. Thank you. Outstanding. Yeah, gotta stick together. I'm right. Here. How rank the co-hosts? <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> um, Wyatt, Charlie, um, Cortez, Pablo. Cortez standing outside, so he's part this of it. Is, this is yeah. what I get for lending you my studio. <laughs> Your studio. Lending. You're welcome. It's a gift. Don't listen to Pablo's show. Do not download it. Oh, Pablo Torre finds out. Do not rate there it. There might do be not, mystery guests do tomorrow. Do not review it. Don't do anything <laughs> with his trash show. If you think that you want to listen to his show, don't. Listen to mine again. If you think you again. want more Dominique Foxworth, you might think to yourself, should I just get no. more Dominique yes. Foxworth's show? The answer Edit is no. Out. Get Pablo Edit Torre finds out. out. Anyway. Or review it. Go on all the things and review it and say, I wish this had more dumb. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. Right yeah. in the comments. As long as five stars, you're more than welcome to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Give him five stars, I guess, because I like him and I want him to have a job. All right. Thank you guys for letting me use the studio. And, of course, thank you to all of my great producers who came through with some great research. research. You're welcome. Megan, Serafina, Kevin, Brian. And I'll give some love to Cortez, too. Yeah. All right. So. We're out of here. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. 